Well, we'll start by <clears throat> excuse me, saying good morning to everybody. I'm glad you all are here this morning. If you have your Bible with you, uh, open up to Isaiah chapter 5. That's where we're going to study this morning. Um, if you don't have one with you, grab the one out of the pew in front of you. Um, there's not going to be any slides up on the screen this morning, uh, so you'll have to follow along in the, in the hard copy version of God's Word this morning. Um, it, it's good to see you all here this morning. Um, as, as Josh had mentioned in his first couple of classes, uh, excited to teach this class. I think I was trying to think back. It's been a handful of trimesters since I've been in an adult class. Um, my last few teaching assignments have had me with the junior high class and the high school class, uh, which was incredibly enjoyable uh, to get and study God's Word with those uh, young people. Uh, but it's good to be to be back teaching uh, in an adult class again, and I'm looking forward to the opportunity to look at uh, this text uh, of Isaiah with you all. Um, looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. Um, I, can, I can tend to, to ramble and go and go and go, but I want to hear also what, what you guys have to say. So if you all have thoughts, comments, please uh, slow me down, stop me, and, uh, and chime in um, to, to bring y'all's input to the class. I think that makes it all the more better. Uh, hearing what you all have to say as well. Um, let's go to God in prayer this morning before we, we start into Isaiah chapter 5. Our God and our Father, um, we're thankful uh, for the opportunity we have to be here together this morning, uh, another opportunity uh, to gather as your people uh, and, and glorify you, praise your name, uh, and lift our worship to you. We're thankful uh, for this period we have this morning that we can open your word, uh, that we can look here at the book of Isaiah uh, specifically uh, at how you've dealt uh, with your children, with your people, uh, the nation of Israel throughout the course of time, how you've um, provided for them, how you've protected them, how you have cultivated and grown them, just as you do with each of us today, um, and how uh, this, this text can enrich our lives in seeing how you deal with your people and your love that you have for your people. Uh, help us as we go through this time of study uh, to, to focus our minds on that and to focus our minds on you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to, as I mentioned, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 5 this morning. And I want to start off by, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lengthy-ish chapter. Um, we're not going to spend the time really looking at and reading verse, for, verse by verse all 30 verses of chapter 5, but I do want to focus on a few specific sections uh, of this text this morning. Uh, and I want to start off by, let's read together uh, verses 1 through 4. So starting in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, it says, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and he cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Uh, so here we see Isaiah laying out for uh, his people here, speaking the words of God and talking about uh, this vineyard. Uh, there's, a, there's an owner, there's a person, his beloved, that owns this vineyard. And he goes on then to, to kind of give some descriptors and describe this vineyard. And um, he, I think it's interesting here that, that uh, significant that he calls it a love song. He's, he's singing, as it were, telling this love song, this love story about this owner of the vineyard and his vineyard, my beloved and his vineyard. Uh, and it is so fitting that this is a love story. We're going to see later down in this chapter in, in verse 7. He goes ahead and tells us that, that God is, is the owner of the vineyard and that Israel, Judah, they're the, the vineyard itself. And so we're seeing Isaiah talking about this love song, this love story between God and his people Israel, his nation of Israel. And it is so fitting and I think significant here that, that he mentions it as a love song, as a love story. Because uh, it really is. That's such a fitting description. Um, it was out of God's abundance of love that he created the world. It was out of his abundance of love that he gave life to man. It was out of his abundance of love that he planted and cultivated the nation of Israel and his people throughout the course of time. 
and putting them in positions to grow, putting them in positions to thrive and to flourish. And it even will be out of his abundance of love for them that he's ultimately going to let them suffer at the hands of Babylon, as we're going to see upcoming, this impending judgment at the hands of Babylon. He's going to, out of his abundance of love, allow them to go through that suffering for the sole purpose of bringing them back to himself, drawing them back, and recreating them anew. Um, So it is a love story. It's a love song about God and how he loves his people and what he's willing to do for his people. Um, As you just read those first four verses, uh, it can't help but but bring to memory and call to mind um, God's enduring love for his creation. Uh, his steadfast faithfulness, his patience, his perseverance with the people of Israel. Um, his, uh, if you remember back through the entire book of Genesis and Exodus, um, a lot of steadfast love and patience on God's behalf as he dealt with uh, the repetitive sinfulness and dysfunction of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all that he dealt with to to cultivate them and grow them and prod them along and to develop them into the people that he wanted them uh, to ultimately become. And as he he developed them and turned them into a great nation that he promised, the nation of Israel. Um, And it calls to mind uh, so many of these events. As you read those, just those first four verses here, um, my mind, as I was reading that this week, you couldn't help but just start having all this, this rundown memory lane of all the things, uh, historical events, things that God had done for his people from creation uh, all the way up to this current state that they're in, all the things that God had done uh, for his people to provide, to protect, and to grow, uh, to shape them and mold them into the identity that they have and to become God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. So I want to take a few minutes today as we kind of look through this chapter, I want to take and really kind of try to focus on three things that stood out to me when I was studying uh, this chapter over the last few weeks. And I want to take some time this morning to look specifically at the elements that we see described here, the descriptors given to the, the vineyard and how those are significant in connecting them back to the history of God's people. I want to take a few minutes to look at um, the, the events that surrounded um, Israel's um, Babylonian captivity, but really see how this paints into the bigger picture, the theme throughout the Bible of what God's doing with his people and how it fits into a consistent theme and parallel uh, through scripture. Uh, and then finally... <clears throat> looking at how uh, Jesus will draw from Isaiah 5 and how he will uh, refer to Isaiah 5 in his ministry and in his teaching um, to the nation of Israel, uh, specifically in in Matthew 21. Uh, So this morning, let's take a a few minutes here. Um, I want to start by just, like I say, going through a few of these descriptors and taking just a moment to to look at each one and how I think it's significant uh, in the description of this text. So it says again, here, he, he planted this vineyard, or my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and he cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it. He hewed out a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes. So a few descriptors that we see right off the bat there describing this vineyard. First one, he says that it was placed in a, a very fertile hill. Um, what is that draw to mind for you? What do you think of there? He describes it as a vineyard that's placed on a very fertile hill. Yeah, Sharon? Okay. Okay. I agree. Yeah, I think, I think, Absolutely, that's, that's one aspect of it there. My, my mind started, started rewinding back to um, just historically and uh, geographically, um, this region of the Middle East that, that God chooses specifically um, to begin humanity, to begin the existence of mankind. Um, does anybody know what that was initially called? 
Okay, it was called the Fertile Crescent. It was the cradle of civilization, right? This, this band that went from kind of Egypt, wrapped up and around through the Mesopotamia, came down in this horseshoe-shaped crescent, geographically on the map, was where God chose to begin the earliest human civilization. And it, it get, gathered the nickname, the Fertile Crescent, just for that reason. It was a land that was ideal for irrigation, farming, life to grow. It was irrigated by the Tigris and the Euphrates River. It had the Nile River. It had all of this water, moisture that would lead to a very fertile and lush landscape. So in a very literal sense, we see God starting creation in a very fertile place. Um, Good. What else can you think of? What else comes to mind when you think of this idea of him planting them in a very fertile place? Good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's rewind even, let's come back to that. Let's rewind back even just a little bit further. Where did he start them? He breathes life into Adam and Eve in a garden, the Garden of Eden. He, he starts out life in this perfection of lush, green garden. Um, God, the gardener here, starts life in an incredibly fertile place. It says what? That, that I'm trying to think back now. The description is like the four rivers flowing into and rivers flowing out of. And it was just this place that was perfect for life. Uh, it had available to Adam and Eve anything and everything they wanted as far as something to eat, something to drink. I mean, it, it was perfect as far as what it provided for God's people. And he began by planting them, as we saw in Genesis 1 through 3, in a garden, in a very fertile place. And then if you fast forward to where Paula's mind went to, <clears throat> we see them having to exit the garden, and now they go kind of on this sojourning through different homes and different lands, through uh, the lives of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and at times being in, in good land and times being in fertile places, and then in other times being in some pretty rough, uh, arid places, until eventually, through the faithfulness of Joseph and through his steadfast love for God, they end up being brought into the land of Egypt. And they're not just given any location in Egypt, but as Paul mentioned, they're given the land of Goshen. Pharaoh says, you can go and inhabit and take my flocks and your flocks, and you go inhabit the land of Goshen, which was the lushest, the greenest, the most fertile, best location you could be at in Egypt. So we see again, God again planting his people in a very fertile place, even during their time in Egypt. Good. And what else, do, is there anything else that comes to mind? If you fast forward a little further down the road of the history of God's people, where else does he plant his people? Yeah, we see him ultimately coming back into the, the promised land, the land of Canaan, which was that land flowing with milk and honey, that, that back into that fertile crescent. And even more specifically than that, he, he makes Jerusalem kind of the center of their life. Um, a city that was very literally a city set on a hill. In this fertile land, he puts them up on this hill, Jerusalem, in this city that would be their place of, of, of life, their place to live, and he would put himself there uh, in Jerusalem with them. So we, this idea that we see the, him growing this garden on a very fertile hill, um, in both a literal sense and a spiritual sense, is, is so fitting the description that he gives to it. Any other thoughts on that, on the descriptor here of a very fertile hill? All right, so he continues on in verse 2. After, after that, he says, and he dug it. Speaking of God, he dug it. He cleared it of stones. He planted it with choice vines. Um, so we see now this description of, of God, as I mentioned, God the gardener working on his creation. Um, talking about kind of portraying God here as this loving gardener uh, who is tending to and taking care of uh, his vineyard. Uh, anyone who's ever started a garden or if you farm, uh, you know how much work 
goes into that process. Whether you, you know, are a farmer who goes out and you've got 500 acres of crop to take care of, or if you've got a, you know, 10 foot by 10 foot raised bed in your backyard to take care of, uh, you understand just the, the work that goes into making that a success. Um, the work that has to go in from finding the plot of land that you're going to use that's ideal. You know, the water will kind of drain off this way. It's not too flat. It's not here. You know, finding that exact place to put it, digging it, taking all the weeds out, taking all the rocks out, maybe even just down on your hands and knees one by one, picking out everything that could in, impede and inhibit the growth of your garden. You go through the work of, of digging it and prepping it and taking everything out that doesn't need to be there. And then even just the, the digging every hole and planting a seed and watering it and just going through the whole process, how much labor is involved in that process. And that's what's saying here is what, what God did for Israel was just that. He went through this laborsome work process of digging, digging, clearing, and planting them. And it, it just shows, and I think expresses here, the level of love and care and concern that God has and had for the nation of Israel and how much he wanted and desired to see them flourish. He was purposeful and intentional in his plans, as we've, we've started to highlight, um, throughout their history and the places, the paths that he carved for them to go, the places that he planted them from creation to this current state. Uh, he was always making every effort and doing the work to see them grow and succeed. Um, just seeing that time and time again. And what, what makes that, you know, in my mind, you think, well, what makes that a labor that you want to take on? What is it about going through and, and digging that garden in your backyard and clearing that, that place, taking all the stones out, weeding it all the time, watering it, going through all that labor, all that work? What is it that makes it worthwhile? Why do you do it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get something from it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be working this and down on my hands and knees. And I'm going to be weeding. I'm going to be doing all this. But at the end, I can just, I can taste the strawberries now. I can taste the, whatever it is, you, you, you can see ahead to the point where I can see what I'm going to reap from all this hard work. I can taste what I'm going to get back from this. And it makes that labor a little easier to endure. It makes that work a little easier to do. Um, and it's interesting that the thought kept coming to my mind as I was thinking about this this week, all that work that God put into the nation of Israel, he puts into each of us with that idea in mind. It's interesting to think that he knew full well from the beginning what the nation of Israel was going to do with everything that he did for them. He knew that despite the fact that he was going to put in all this work and labor in growing and cultivating them, that that fruit that he was hoping, those grapes that he was hoping he was going to get, were never going to grow. Knowing that despite everything that I was going to go through to do this, the abundance of love that he had for them still allowed him to put in that work, pour in that sweat, knowing that uh, at least right in this moment, he wasn't going to taste uh, the, the reward of his labor. Any thoughts, any thoughts there on on God digging, cultivating, clearing, growing Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, and Bobby said, I mean, he, he, he put in everything. He gave him every opportunity, he gave him everything, and that's what we're really going to come back to here in a minute. Yeah, very good. Any others? So he continues on in, uh, in verse 2, and it says, Then that after God had dug and cleared and planted, he'd done that work. Now he's, he builds. He builds in the middle of, of the vineyard. Uh, a watchtower. He puts a watchtower in the middle of it um, for the purposes, I think, of, of watching over it. Uh, you know, what, what is a watchtower going to serve for? Um, you know, it, it gives someone a high vantage point that they can get up in that watchtower and they can survey, they can overlook 
their property, whether that you think back to like a crow's nest on an old pirate ship where somebody can crawl up in the crow's nest and watch and see what's going on out at sea. You know, you've got military things and, and, and where, you know, you've got turrets and watchtowers on the corners of castles and things to where guards can stand up or armed men can stand up in these and get a better vantage watch of what's going on, of any impeding attack, anything that might be coming uh, to bring harm. And I think that's the idea that we're we're supposed to get from this here is this, this idea of God putting a watchtower in the midst of it allowed him, allowed God, the owner of this vineyard, uh, a vantage where he could overlook his vineyard, his people, and, and see the potential threats to their well-being and address them. Uh, and how do we see that play out? What comes to your mind when you think of that idea, when you look back through God's history, how has God been a watchtower in the midst of his people? Good, okay. Him being a, uh, a light for them through the wilderness, the cloud, the, the, the fire, very good. Okay, priests and prophets having his people amongst them to lead and guide. Yeah, somebody else over there? No? So my, my mind went back again. I, I kind of immediately rewound all the way back to the garden. And you think about God as being in the midst of his people. We see in, in Genesis 3 here, God walking in the midst of the garden with Adam and Eve. Um, you know, from the beginning, he's got him in this fertile place and he is literally in their midst, walking with them, dwelling there in the garden with him uh, and they're together. God's presence is there in the garden with Adam and Eve at creation and how he is dwelling in the midst of his people. And if you, you fast forward that a little bit further down the road, you get to Sinai and God has his people gathered there around Mount Sinai and he descends on the mountain. He gives Moses not only the, the commandments, but then he lays out for Moses the layout, the, the blueprints for what? The tabernacle. And, and that's going to be a place, right, that, that's going to exist, that's going to travel with the people throughout their wanderings, that's going to dwell, they're going to build it, pitch that tent right in the middle of their encampment, right in the middle of their um, home, wherever that may be as they're wandering, and he's going to fill that place, and he's going to dwell right there amongst his people. In the form of the tabernacle, God is going to be a watchtower. He's going to dwell with his presence in the middle of his people. And then if you bring that forward a little further into Second Chronicles chapter 5, we see that tabernacle go away, and then we're going to see God's presence in the form of what? Or his presence take, uh, fill what? The temple. Yeah, we see God's presence then filling the temple. And the temple is going to be God's presence, God's dwelling amongst his people, in the middle of his people. As we see them inhabit Jerusalem, they become this, this city set on a hill, and God's going to create and construct this temple in the middle of the city, and then he's going to dwell there amongst his people. And how God in that sense has been a watchtower, uh, putting his presence and his dwelling amongst his people from the beginning all the way up to this point in time. Um, and you can even fast forward that further into the application of how he's dwelling in us today. And he's a watchtower in the midst of his church, in the midst of his people amongst us today. Um, looking forward, the last thing that he mentions here that I want to touch on, well, there's, there's two more really, but, but he talks here about, uh, he looks for it to yield grapes. Um, I think there's a, a few things that, that obviously there's a, there's a few things that this could be pointing to. There's lots of ways that, that Israel could have been fruitful, uh, for God, could have produced what he was looking for in them. Um, but I think at the heart of it, it really comes back to, to Genesis 12. And in Genesis 12, where God speaks to Abraham and, and gives him those promises, the promise that they're going to become a great nation, right? They're going to get a land. And then the promise that they're going to become a blessing to all the nations. 
Um, I really think that's kind of at the heart of what this idea of them yielding grapes, them being fruitful. Um, you know, God's people were supposed to be a blessing to all the other nations around them, uh, but it couldn't have turned out any more far from the truth. Um, not just through the coming Messiah, which we would see ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, how Abraham's family would ultimately become a blessing to the entire world. But I think in, in a very real sense at that day and time, they were supposed to be the nation that was exemplifying God's love, exemplifying God's justice and righteousness in how they interacted with each other, how they interacted with the surrounding nations. Uh, as we've said, they, they were supposed to be the city set on a hill. They were supposed to be the light shining in the darkness. They were supposed to be the ones that were different. Um, but instead, they ended up just as dark, just as corrupt, just as wicked, just as unrighteous as all the, the pagan nations that surrounded them. Um, they were supposed to be this one that shone God's light, be different than the surrounding nations, but yet they became indistinguishable. As we've seen in the first four chapters, we're going to continue to see throughout the book of Isaiah, their choices and their lives made them indistinguishable from the world around them when they should have been a, a blessing to all the nations around them. Uh, and they just didn't do it. They became wild grapes. They became what was just planted everywhere. They just grew up when they should have been something that says he planted from choice vines, grapes that should have been different, that should have come up yielding different fruit. Instead, they just yielded the same old fruit as, as, they was, as was found around them. Uh, and, and the final piece that I just want to mention for, for a moment or two here, um, it doesn't, doesn't specifically word this in the description, um, but it, it talks about it here as we'll go down and see in a minute in verse 5, 6, and 7. Uh, it talks about how he removes a hedge that's around him. He removes a wall that's been around him. And, and through that, we can, we can infer then that uh, you know, God built a hedge and he built a wall around Israel. Uh, and I think speaking there, talking to and, and, and pointing to the fact that, as Bobby had mentioned earlier, he had been since the very beginning, since the garden and the place that he put them to start civilization, uh, he had continually been provider and protector for his people. Um, he had always been there to provide for them all that they needed and continually protect them uh, from, from harm. Uh, what things can you think of? And this is this is easy one, audience participation time. What things can you think of? What comes to mind immediately when you think of God as provider for his people from the garden to where we sit now in the divided kingdom about to go into Babylon? Yeah, manna in the wilderness. God, uh, as, they're, as they're journeying through, as we said, sometimes they were in places that weren't so fertile. You know, they get pushed out of or drawn out of lands and God takes them wandering through arid environments and he continues to provide not only manna, but he provides quail, he provides water. He provides the things that they needed during those lean times and those times of wandering. Good. What else can you think of? Protection? Yeah. Yeah. Hang on to that one. We're going to come right there in a second. What, um, any other things that jump to your mind? You think of God as provider. Clothing in the garden. Okay. He provides them clothing to cover their shame in the garden. Good. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's countless ways, right? I mean, you see God providing everything they could possibly need in the garden. You see them being driven out of the garden. And then God would provide a way of escape for Noah and his family when he's going to decreate and destroy everything that he created by way of the flood. He provides a means of escape for Noah and his family because of Noah's faithfulness. We see him providing a child of promise to Abraham and Sarah when they thought there was no way that, that this could, this plan of God's is going to work. We're too old. This isn't going to happen. And he provides the child of promise to Abraham and Sarah. We see him continually, as, as you remember back through the, the book of Genesis, it's just time and time again of God 
providing children, providing land, providing prosperity, providing wealth to the families of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, despite their failures and despite their dysfunction, God t- continually providing and um, giving them what they need to succeed despite their frequent lack of faith. Um, we see him provide for them in Egypt, but then also provide their way of escape out of Egypt, uh, provides them a way out uh, from the, the terrible backbreaking labor that they were put through and the, the harsh treatment and slavery in Egypt. He brings about Moses to help provide a way of escape. As she mentioned, through the wilderness, we see him providing. Ultimately at Sinai there, he's going to provide the law of Moses. He's going to provide a set of rules and guidelines that would act as a tutor and as a guide for the people on how they're to interact with their God and how they're to interact with one another. God's continually been providing from the very beginning. And then you think about God, you know, as a protector, um, what he's done for the nation of Israel uh, through their time. Uh, what, what ways can you think of that he acted as protector of his people? Yeah, good. I mean, how many times did God go to battle for the nation of Israel? I mean, how many victories did God win for the nation of Israel that that there was no way they could have won on their own? I mean, I just started jotting down, kind of scribbling out a list of of the ones that came to mind. And I mean, immediately off the top of my head, just thinking of Egypt, exiting Egypt, parting the Red Sea, literally God coming down at the edge of the Red Sea in the form of a hedge, a wall that divided Israel from Egypt, from Pharaoh and his army, brought down this this cloud that stood in between them like a wall that was impenetrable for the uh, the, um, forces of Pharaoh uh, as they made their escape through the waters of the Red Sea. You think through, as you mentioned, the the time conquering the land uh, there in Canaan and Battles like the city of Jericho, marching around a city one time for six days and then marching around it seven times one day and yelling and shouting and blowing trumpets and this great fortified city comes down, giving them a battle victory that they could have never achieved on their own. Battling against the Amorites in Joshua chapter 9, God raining down huge stones to kill soldiers of the Amorites. And it says there, I think it specifically mentions that he killed more with the stones than the Israelites could have ever killed on their own. Uh, God giving that victory into their hands. I think in the time of the judges, in Judges 7, God taking an army of 32,000 people that Gideon had there at his disposal and whittling that down to ultimately 300 people to take into battle against a far superior and far greater numbered battle against the Midianites. And God using the uh, the, the weapons of torches and trumpets to take down that army to show the people that, that he was their protector. He was the one going to battle for his people. And then the last one I thought of that I scribbled down, just this idea, just David and Goliath. I mean, God taking the future king shepherd boy and putting him up against the greatest warrior, against, uh, the greatest warrior of their greatest enemy at the time, the Philistines, and him putting them pitting them one-on-one with some sling, or with some stones and a sling, and him giving the victory to his people Israel and, and pushing away the nation of Philistia. Um, God protecting his people time and time again. And that's just a small number of the examples that you could list out, but God providing and protecting over and over and over again throughout his history as a wall and as a hedge for his people to, to eliminate the threats, eliminate what could come in, and, and do harm to what he is cultivating, to what he is growing as the loving gardener, what he is, is trying to create in them. He's taking every length and every measure to, to protect. Um, and, and I think it's fitting then the conclusion in verse 4 that, that God comes to. Isaiah says here in, in the, the end of these four verses, after calling the reader here, you know, to remember and think back all that God's done, all that he's, he's provided, God's concluding thought in verse 4 is, 
what more is there to do for my vineyard that I haven't already done? You know, what more can I do? I've, I've, I've provided, I've protected, I've grown, I've dug, I've put in everything that I can put in. And you were supposed to yield grapes. You were supposed to be this city set on a hill. You were supposed to be this light to the surrounding nations. That didn't happen. You're in, indistinguishable from the people around you. You're just as corrupt and wicked. And as I mentioned earlier, it's interesting to think that God knowing that went through all of the labor and the work involved to cultivate and grow them, knowing that this is what was going to happen. He was going to end up with wild grapes, a nation that was disinterested and did not want to have them as their king and have him or him as their king and him as their God. Uh, any thoughts on, on verses one through four before we move on? Very good. Yeah, let's go ahead and read. The next thing I wanted to read, let's read five through seven, kind of wrap up this, this parable here that <clears throat> Isaiah is speaking. He's, he finishes it in five through seven. And now I will tell you what I will do for my vineyard. Because, because God looks at it and says, what more can I do? Now I'll tell you what I, what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge. It'll be devoured. I will break down its wall. It will be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns will grow up. It will, it will, I will also command the clouds that they will rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. He looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So yeah, as, as you mentioned, you know, God's concluding thought there in four, what, what more is that I can do? At this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to allow judgment. I'm going to take down the protections that I've given. I'm going to remove the hedge that I've put up. I'm going to remove the wall that I've put up. I'm going to allow the weeds to overgrow it. I'm going to allow things to come in from the outside and trample it. I'm going to allow it to go through this process of destruction, decreation, with the vision in mind, as we're going to see, of ultimately being able to recreate them anew here in the future. Uh, and let's, let's conclude with that thought here this morning. We have just a few minutes. Um, as usual, I won't make it through everything I intended to talk about, so we'll pick up on Wednesday. Um, but this, this last idea here, I want to just quickly tie into this, this bigger theme I think we're seeing here in Isaiah chapter 5 alluded to in paralleling Scripture as a whole of God creating decreating and recreating. And if you look for that throughout scripture, you see it time and time again. Um, how this, this idea here with Israel is just a smaller zoomed in version of what God did in uh, Genesis with the creation and the flood uh, with, God's, with, with the world as a whole. You see in Genesis 1, God taking the world and creating it and then because of the wickedness of that creation, because of their choices and what they've done to turn their backs on God, he brings about judgment through the flood. He destroys it all. It says in, in Genesis how he had restrained the waters at creation. And now in Genesis 7, when it's time to flood, he lets loose the waters from above and the waters from below. He pulls back the hedge. He pulls back the wall and allows the waters to come down and consume the earth again, destroying it, decreating everything that he had previously created. But he recreates. Because of the faithfulness of Noah, because of the faithfulness of that remnant in that boat, in the ark, God would then repopulate the world through the family of Noah, bringing back to himself a, a new creation. He's going to recreate everything after the flood through Noah and bringing this all back again and starting over. Uh, and I think 
it's interesting that you see this again taking place on kind of a zoomed in version with Israel. He, he, he takes through the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He cultivates, he grows, he creates this nation. That nation gets to a point where the corruption, the wickedness is, is too much. And now just like he did with the world in the flood, he says it's, it's time to pull back the hedge. It's time to pull back the wall. It's time to allow everything to flood in. The nations around, I'm going to bring Babylon. I'm going to bring the surrounding nations in judgment. And I'm going to allow them to wipe out and decreate what I've created in Israel. I'm going to allow that destruction, that decreation to take place. But ultimately what he's going to do is then take a, again, like Noah in that boat with his family, he's going to take a, a small remnant of the people that remain faithful. He's going to take men of leadership like Zerubbabel and men of leadership like Ezra, men of leadership like Nehemiah, and he's going to bring them back into the land. He's going to rebuild a temple. He's going to rebuild through Ezra, spirituality of the people. And then through Nehemiah, he's going to rebuild a wall around his city, Jerusalem. And he's going to recreate this Israel back into a better version of what it was. Israel is going to go through this same process of creation, decreation, and recreation before God. Um, and ultimately seeing that, you know, culminate in uh, the creation and recreation of man through his seed, Christ, which is messianically talked about and brought forth here. And that's where we'll pick up on Wednesday. We'll conclude the, the last portion here of chapter five and then move into chapter six. Uh, so if you, if you have time this week, sit and read the remainder of, of chapter five or, or just chapter five maybe again. And then look at Matthew 21. Because Matthew 21 is where we're gonna look at a little bit on Wednesday before we move into chapter six of Isaiah. All right, thank y'all.